Centre for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. And I think we're generally here to sort of talk about how can we improve people's understanding of the scientific process through um, tools like telling stories. So, um, okay, I'll, I'll spin a little bit to background as to why this is called science and, or as one topic is science and storytelling. Um, about 10 years or so, so I'm a working evolutionary biologist. I've been at the University of Wisconsin for a very long time. I've worked particularly on a molecular genetics of evolutionary process. And as I started to do more public speaking and then write for the public, started writing some books in the, uh, maybe about eight to 10 years ago, um, and doing a lot more contact with the public and with the teaching community, obviously was getting a, a, a good sense of what was going on in terms of um, evolutionary education. And at the same time, the intelligent design movement had sort of um, come out of its hole and was getting a lot of press. And that was all leading up to the 2005 Dover um, case in, in Pennsylvania. And if you know the Dover case, it was a really important test case of intelligent design. Um, the, I thought at the time the press did a horrible job of sort of laying out what was, uh, what was at stake. Um, they seemed to sort of take the bait that there was somehow some legitimate scientific argument. Uh, I remember begging reporters to look into the constitutional side of this, and that's of course where in fact the decision was going to wind up. It was going to be a constitutional law decision more than anything else. Um, but of course that, you know, that uh, movement, well, it's, it's morphed in various ways, but those, uh, those roots go pretty deep in the U.S., and probably 30, 35 percent of the country is uh, uh, probably immovable on the, on the, on the issue of, of evolution in, a, in an adverse way. So as a working scientist, you sort of think, well, what, you know, what positive impact can one's work have? And when, you, when I saw how little traction well-established science had out there, and I saw how much teachers were struggling with the teaching of evolution, I just thought, well, maybe there's something more that I can do. And it really was contact with teachers that I found really inspiring, and teachers in large numbers, um, because I think they were, on the whole, very eager to bring good content to their students and to sort of stand their ground, but they needed a lot of help finding that content, and they needed the help, I think, particularly the scientific community, of backing them up. And I think relative to where things were, say, 2000, 2001, things this, I give a reasonable report card at the moment. I think scientific societies, um, the teaching profession, professional scientists, I think have gotten uh, their act together in a much better way to deal with uh, these grass fires that just will continually pop up in the states of you know, some legislator or school board member or school board president or whatever trying to either squeeze evolution out of the classroom or squeeze creationism in, in some form or another uh, into the classroom. So I, I would at least say that I think the, um, the structure and the experience is in place to deal with these things. It doesn't mean that it will ever go away. But there's lots of other things cooking uh, south of the border. Maybe some of these are here too. Um, Anti-vaccination, which is now showing up as epidemics of things like whooping cough in Wisconsin, in Texas. Uh, the climate change discussion. So with that as a, as a um, <laughs> portfolio, um, a few years ago, I, I thought that, that maybe we could do something in terms of educational media. And I got the opportunity, um, I was offered to, to lead the uh, science education efforts of an organization called the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And don't be fooled by the name, it's the largest private supporter of science education in the United States. So I took that opportunity about three years ago with the intention that through media, and that means educational media as well as the use of the media, um, that we could do a better job at equipping teachers with teaching kids about the scientific process. So I'm not gonna make a really long speech about that, but I, um, I'll t I can tell you in the course of our conversations a little more about what that entails. But one ingredient in that, one uh, conviction I had is that storytelling is an important part of that strategy, or an important part of being effective in education. And storytelling might have sort of a negative connotation, but I, what I mean by storytelling is that I, rather than kids confronting a textbook with you know, bold-faced terms that they're asked to memorize for the test, weaving that information more into a narrative and a narrative that's more engaging and 
plenty of psychological studies will prove out that our brains are sort of wired to receive stories. And stories help us connect cause and effect. They help us connect events over time. And so, uh, but that's not how generally kids encounter science. They encounter science in very small, pre-chewed chunks of pretty dry matter, at least in, in text form. And if they don't get to do science, say in a laboratory or things like that, that's their picture of science, is essentially a, a, a you know, bolus of, of facts. So um, we can talk a little bit more about storytelling because there's lots of different ways to tell stories, but um, I, I don't want to undermine my own case by starting to tell you stories and losing everybody. So, um, <laughs> and I'm gonna tell some story, uh, at least I'm gonna tell a rather involved story later tonight. But uh, I thought I'd just give you that as, as a little bit of background and um, maybe you can challenge me or, or ask me some questions about um, how do you pick a good story to tell? What are the ingredients of those stories? How, how do you tell the story? How do you distribute it to, the, to as broad an audience as possible? We could explore those kinds of realms. Go ahead, go ahead. What, what do you think about a lot of the, um, it's a lot of new science shows showing up on television. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think they're doing a good job of um, getting a good message out? They seem to be better quality than they used to be. So well, that may be true in Canada. Uh, I, I don't know, what's that? The States is horrible. Oh, really? And I'm not exaggerating, the States is a disaster. Um, so you've, there's been a tradition, I, I think Canada has actually been better off on the whole, um, and the same with the UK in terms of television. But in the US, sort of our shorthand for it is the race to the bottom. And what's happened is, and I think there are a couple um, sort of canaries you know, in the coal mine that will really show you what happened. So National Geographic. How many subscribe to the magazine, right? No, okay. That yellow border, I mean, basically what you see inside that yellow border in terms of the quality of the photography, the diversity of stories, a pretty darn good magazine for a century, okay? Well, they started a TV channel. Well, their partner in that TV channel, their 51% partner in that TV channel is Fox, okay? <laughs> Well, let's just say when the rubber hits the road and there's uh, some perhaps conflict between commerce and art or commerce and content, commerce wins. And so instead of seeing the sort of content on that channel that you might see in the magazine, you see, you know, a hillbilly, snake wrestling, whatever, you know, just take your pick uh, of bizarre, backwoods, fringy sort of stuff. And this stuff is extremely cheap to make. So this is the whole secret of, quote, reality television, is that it's really cheap to make and profitable as you pour out the hours and, and, and uh, syndicate them around the world. So National Geographic, this is one of the um, tragedies that makes you know, the founders and, and, the, and some of the trustees you know, pull, just want to poke their eyes out, is that that brand, which had a, just an absolutely stellar reputation in the States, is really sullied by what they've put on television. And I'll, I'll tell you some more stories uh, from that world. Yeah. I'd like to challenge you just a bit there. I think that there are probably two sectors of scientific um, television shows in the US. One, probably the PBS world, and one is the Discovery, MGS, a &E, whatever, uh, or TLC, whatever, right. that at one time had uh, a lot of grants uh, when they first started and then went downhill and stayed in the bottom. But PBS and um, NOVA and stuff like that, and Prime Time, which is not scientific, but it has science in it, they have a lot of good stuff. So to simply say that there's no good TV in the US is no, no, I, I, I absolutely accept that correction. I, I think I was, so you, you were talking about a lot of new shows on TV, and there are new, no sh new shows on TV on PBS dealing with science, but yes, NOVA has held its ground against the trend, which has been this uh, trend towards, I think, um, sort of the sensational, the trivial, if not sometimes the supernatural. Uh, whereas Discovery and NGS, which started out, I think, with really watchable stuff, and you know, it looked very promising for cable to be a source of, you know, of really broadening the, the palette. Um, and just the economics have gone in a different direction. And you can just choose not to watch them. But the problem is, you know, I got kids, I got, you know, what were my kids gonna watch on TV growing up? Well, by, by volume, there's just a lot more stuff 
out on these other channels than there is on PBS for them to watch. And so I think the collective effect of that has been pretty negative. And it's an, an enormously missed opportunity. Now just to come back to your point, so I believe in film as a really powerful medium for telling story. So uh, one of the reasons I went to Hughes and the idea I had in my hip pocket, I'd done a lot of work on uh, documentary film, a lot of stuff on PBS, a little bit on some other channels. And I, especially from being in the field with filmmakers, I thought that filmmakers and scientists were natural collaborators, that we both brought really complementary skills and experience to the table. But I generally found sort of other folks who weren't out in the field with us mm, could spoil the mix. Things that happened later, decisions that happened later, perhaps uh, in, in more executive suites. So one of the first things I started in going to Hughes was um, to actually start our own in-house television production unit. And I hired the outgoing president of National Geographic Television. That's not of the channel. National Geo has the channel, and National Geo has a, its longstanding television production unit, which dates all the way back to sort of you know, specials we saw decades ago, um, and Michael Rosenfeld. So he heads that up. So this is, this is done in-house, and that means we have editorial control. So the problem with, it, you know, we're a philanthropy doing science education, the problem with just writing a check is you don't have the editorial control. And as a science and education organization, we wanted to be sure that what, would, what goes out on air is scientifically rigorous. Um, so our first programs will, be, will start appearing in the spring next year. The first is a three-part series based on Neil Shubin's book, Your Inner Fish, if you happen to know the book. So that will be a special on PBS. Um, in, in April. So PBS is the most receptive network to making high quality, for, for high quality science programs, remains that. Um, but they're um, a bit lonely in that space in the United States. Yeah. But most people still get their information from television. So it's an, it's an important source to have at least some information. Yeah. Do you guys have any idea what the contacts are going to be reading, reading those up because why us is that going to happen? Yeah, I can tell you the story. Yeah, it's, 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 it's no great secret. Um, so, uh, and this is an interesting, I think, a positive development in the States. The, there's a lot of people in the entertainment industry and uh, around Hollywood that are very interested in science, really serious people who are, really think science has an important part in our culture, such to the point that they started an organization in alliance with the National Academy of Sciences um, to sort of serve as a referral and consulting service to um, the entertainment industry. That could be television, game development, feature film, et cetera. It's called the Science and Entertainment Exchange. And one of the things that that group does is they hold these events, in Southern, usually in Southern California, where scientists come and talk to um, Hollywood talent. And that usually behind the camera talent, producers, screenwriters, directors. And at one of those events, Neil deGrasse Tyson was speaking, and Seth MacFarlane, the creator of Family Guy, and Oscar host last year. Uh, Seth is a huge science buff, and a big Carl Sagan fan. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, has for a long time wanted to remake Cosmos. And so the two of them got together, and Seth has a lot of pull at Fox, because I think he has maybe four shows on Fox. And um, so it's gonna be a, 13-part series uh, and involves uh, the Sagan, you know, Sagan's family is involved and it's a remake of, or you know, 30 some plus years later, a, a redo of, of Cosmos scheduled for, for next year. Um, I also, on Fox, network television. I think cross your fingers, everybody, because I think it's gonna do well. I think people haven't seen anything like this for a long time, particularly in the States, and um, it might open up possibilities for a little more science on, on the, the larger broadcast networks. So my fingers are all, are all crossed for that. Seth is, Seth is a really good guy, Seth McFarlane. Uh, it just turns out he hosted an event that I did, so I've, and I've had some other chances to know what interests him. And I, I, I think this is public information, but next month, um, so he, uh, he bought the Carl Sagan papers for the Library of Congress and is donating them. So uh, I know there's an event there in, a, in about a month. So there are some really good folks um, who would like to see more serious science. Now I think you know, there's gonna be some balance there of, there's gonna be entertainment in this show, but 
Um, but Neil deGrasse Tyson is hosting, and, and Seth MacFarlane played a big role behind that. That's why it's on Fox. And I think the rebroadcast will be on the National Geographic Channel. Yeah. And they're both quite capable of resisting any pressure. I don't. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to speculate. I mean, Seth MacFarlane gets away with a lot in his own shows, so I, I feel that he's he's a very valuable part of their um, of their family. And, uh, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think this has uh, been a dream project for him that he's wanted to do for a long time. So I'm just going to, you know, I wish them a lot of luck and I cross my fingers that everyone's going to like what comes out or that it will be successful in, in everyone's eyes. And that, uh, I think that would be a really good thing for television in the U.S. Yeah? I, I uh, watch almost every science documentary that comes out and BBC puts out by far and away the best mm -hmm. documentaries. And I'm just wondering if you see any future in the U.S. of that. We should get more of them. I, I don't know why BBC America doesn't broadcast more of them. BBC's had a long-running deal with Discovery, which just um, ended. Um, so that's why Discovery Channel in the US, for example, had Planet Earth. There's a story that goes around about that, if you want me to tell it. Um, so you all know the Planet Earth series. I Was it five years, maybe, in the making, right? Uh, an enormous undertaking with crews in the field for months and months and months to get this really rare footage of any particular segment. The story goes, and I think it's confirmed from, from decent sources. I'm aware, I would be much less cautious, but there's two cameras on me at the moment, is that right? So <clears throat> anyway, but the story goes that um, when the Discovery execs first saw planet Earth, their, their reaction was, what the hell are we going to do with this? All right, the first thing they got to do is get an American narrator, right? So they get Sigourney Weaver or whatever. But they, they were panicked at planet Earth. What are they, who the hell is going to watch this? And I mean, the home box office sales alone, you know, home video sales alone, you know, you could essentially, you know, buy a state with it. So, uh, you know, not everybody even knows gold when they see it, even if they're sort of in the, in the, in the position. Um, but so that deal with BBC Discovery is, is, um, is over with. Uh, I don't think we see nearly enough BBC. Some of the BBC science shows are um, refashioned for Nova. There's some things that, that, that get onto Nova from BBC and certainly from, from British producers. I think, uh, I talk, to this, talk about this with my friends in Britain all the time. There's just a really long, uninterrupted tradition of great documentary filmmaking that really started in England. I mean, BBC was the model that folks like Nova emulated. And what I mean by and that the benefit of that long tradition, and I understand this now more uh, acutely in that we are our own documentary production company, is that BBC had an apprenticeship system. I mean, the number of people who worked with David Attenborough, I mean, you know, you could make a really good, you could fill a room with them, okay? So there was a way to sort of go from junior filmmaker to, you know, to full-fledged, you know, sort of senior filmmaker or, you know, pr person in charge, cinematographers, et cetera. And, and, there was, and there was steady employment and steady work. In the U.S., it's a freelance model. It's, it's really hard to be an independent filmmaker. Uh, you know, no, no salary, no benefits, right? And the work is here and there and here and there. And as the work has migrated most heavily to cable and budgets have come down. Filmmakers are asked to do a lot more with a lot less. And a lot more means not just the whole film, but I mean post-production on all this sort of thing. So I have you know, a good number of people I know as independent filmmakers, and it's a, it's a really, I mean, it's a passion job, but it, you know, it shouldn't be, have to be one of you know, living hand to mouth, right? So I think, uh, Britain's just had the advantage of, of probably 40 years plus of a system where you can find talent at sort of all sorts of levels of experience and there was a place, the BBC, to incubate that talent and not so in the, in the States. So you could hope that that might change. Um, great question. I think, I think the weak link there has been the really uneven uh, teaching of evolution actually in the classroom. That 
I, I think what you know, people 22 and over get exposed to, I, I, first of all, I don't think it changes a lot of people's minds on things that are so fundamental like that. I think that it's what you get exposed to in the home and, and in school and how well, how much sense that makes um, that has a big impact. And the teaching of evolution in the states has been very dodgy. Lots of states just absent from the curriculum for long periods of time. Chapters are buried deep in textbooks. It was not considered um, really job one, goal one, priority one in terms of biology teaching I th until I think the last decade when biologists and educators came to their senses and said, my goodness, we've been teaching around this so much, we've gotten sort of in the habit of this, this is, we've, we've, we've created this, you know, we've contributed to this problem. So when you see school standards now, that, now being adopted by large numbers of states, um, one sort of indicator, the Advanced Placement Biology Program, um, which about a quarter million bio high school biology students are enrolled in any given year, evolution is unit one, you know, priority one. So there's been a, a change in making evolution a central part of biology teaching. I think it was really on the periphery and very hit and miss for all those decades you're talking about. Um, so to see some gains, I think you're gonna, we're going to have to wait, though, because I think it's kids in the pipeline now that may, you may see some shifting of balance and that they're getting exposed to more evolutionary science and I think more persuasive, more sticky evolutionary science than they did before. Um, I would submit, and I'll get myself in trouble with uh, anyone who's, who's, who's taught here, but I think that one of the weaknesses of evolutionary teaching uh, is we, we taught what we could but there were things you would have loved to be able to, to teach a little bit better. And I think in particular, um, population genetics, just to get a little technical here, but I think population genetics, a mathematical approach to evolution that was sort of divorced from the organisms themselves, uh, I don't think that's very sticky in kids' minds, and I say that having taught this for 25 years. I think the great thing in the last 15 years or so, 20 maybe, my, which is somehow parallel to my time in, in this field, has been a golden age for evolutionary science in terms of um, advancing our empirical understanding, being able to really see the evolutionary process at work, whether that's the evolution of traits or the making of new species, things like this. And those, that body of work, I think, is just much more um, persuasive and engaging in a classroom than what we could have taught 20 years ago. So I would say a couple things, you know, changing the emphasis to make evolution priority one, having better evolutionary content to present to kids, and then it's presenting it in a better way. And I think the better way is more inquiry-driven, less you know, memorization-driven. I mean, I, I inherited courses from professors at Wisconsin where it said the section on evolution was the memorization of essentially all the major taxa on the planet. That's not evolutionary science. That is how to kill any curiosity about science in a kid, is memorizing Latin names for, you know, for weeks on end. So there are people just, it's just a terrible way to, to get across ideas of, you know, where does diversity come from, things like this. I just listened to uh, Richard uh, Dawkins on the way down, and uh, a passage that he recorded is uh, in his, uh, he's saying that one of the things we put into the Ten Commandments for uh, atheists is that uh, you would oblige yourself to teach your children the process of inquiry, mm -hmm. and that to even doubt the parents, using that tool to doubt the parents. So then you would implant in your pre-12 uh, you know, group the seed of uh, and the tool to counteract the dogma that we've got. It's a very, I mean, it's, it's a great point. And I, I think it's a very interesting thing in the States. Uh, I don't know how prevalent it is up here. I, I feel when I come to Canada, I, I'm, I finally come to a civilized English-speaking country. But um, it's a continuum. It's a continuum, thank you, yeah. So. Um, in the States, we have this huge skeptic um, thread, you know, don't believe the government, don't believe this, but of course it leads to a whole lot of wacky kind of conspiracy theory sort of thinking and, you know, we didn't land on the moon and all that sort of stuff. So you have that thread there, but we don't seem to have perhaps as much healthy skepticism as we should. Um, so if, if you want, you know, if you want to raise your kids with a healthier sense of skepticism, then I think you have to follow, you know, some, some sort of um, line of thought, because they're not necessarily going to get a lot of that in the, in the school.
you actually think that science writers and scientists understand that you should know? Do scientists and science writers, um, do they understand it well enough? I guess the question is who are they writing? I, I mean, I think writing for, if you're talking about writing for the general public, I, I can't persuade myself that um, that's an incredibly effective mode. I think there, in, in the small number, uh, you know, in a small sector of that population are, for example, educators and things like this, and I think they can make some use of what science writers and scientists have to say. So I think a really crucial population. And here's how the numbers go. In the states, at this given moment, there are gonna be four, or five, four to five million kids taking a high school biology class, right now. There's about 40,000 teachers teaching that, okay? So if we're gonna deal with evolution, those 40,000 are the, are the most important people you can think about, okay? Uh, well, yeah, but if, uh, if, if you could, uh, and that and that may be, if that is true, I hope it's not thirty to thirty-five percent. But there's what's that? The teachers themselves, thirty to thirty-five percent. I, I suspect that's a little high of, of the teachers themselves. But let's let's say it's a double-digit percentage, just to make you worry. I'm going to still worry about the other sixty-five percent. Okay, because here's the thing, unless there's you know, more rigorous screening and people get fired for bad teaching, um, which is a whole nother kettle of fish, we gotta focus on the teachers who are gonna try to do a good job, back them up, have standards that make sense, um, test kids' competencies along these sorts of lines. And I think there's movement in that direction on lots of fronts in the United States. But I think it's, you know, you're looking at a 20, 25 year process before we're gonna you know, pull our heads up and go, well, does the country poll any differently than it did in 1980 or 2010? This is a long, long battle. You asked me specifically about science writers and scientists and, and, and their impact, and I think their impact is most important upon that population of 40,000, uh, and that's a very highly churned population, by the way, that 40,000. There's a lot of new ones minted every year. There's a lot retiring and quitting going out the other door. And so, in fact, how new teachers are even trained to be teachers and how they're trained to teach inquiry, um, that's a really important thing. My organization, we just made the largest grant we ever made to the training of science teachers in the U.S. along a new model that I think has now been replicated in enough institutions to give us some confidence that it's a better way to do things. Um, again, and you know, how long will it take for those dividends well, to pay back? Well, something more, but I know Mrs. Chop here has some. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. You brought up something I had been about to ask that you mentioned creating bad teachers. Is it even possible? I don't know what the answer is offhand, and I certainly don't know what it is in the States. Is it even possible to fire a teacher for bad teaching? In the States, it's, it's, it's uh, pathetically tough. It's even worse here. <laughs> it's very, very, oh, very sorry, hard. Sorry, that it is hard or is it not? It, it is hard to fire a teacher for bad teaching. Yeah. Which is? At, at, so at the K through 12 level, okay. it's difficult. Yeah. Now there's a lot of churn in that population, so you can look at it in other ways, which is maybe some bad ones quit. Maybe you can pressure them to quit, but, uh, but it, it is a problem. I mean, that's just the landscape you're dealing with. I, I have to say, though, having dealt with thousands of teachers directly, now that's not necessarily the 30% you worry about. The, the 12,000 that I haven't dealt with directly, they're off. You know, they're out of play. Um, I'm somewhat optimistic. I think they're, they're, eager, they're eager to do a great job, and they, they just need help. Let me ask you, do you follow the amateur science educators? I'm thinking of like various YouTube channels and people who just put out videos. Or I mean, I, we, 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 I drop in from time to time to see some of the stuff that's going on, and particularly my kids point out stuff that my kids are 20 and 23, so just to put that in age context. But um, yeah, and I don't know what the I don't know what the collective impact of that is for the people who are you know as soon as you run into somebody who's science curious, you know, you've probably won over half the battle right there. Um, but it's all the people that we lose through memorization and making science you know incredibly dull or elusive. So I I do think that that at the college level there's a and the, there's a much greater awareness of how crappy our teaching has been. Um, 
than there has been before. And I think at the high school level, there's, you know, we sort of collectively people know that we're, in, you know, that culturally this is a huge challenge. The teachers I meet are really worried about these issues of, you know, are we vaccinating our kids? Do we know the earth is old? Do we know that life is old? Do we know that life changes? Do we know that in fact the environment changes? It might be changing a little too quickly relative to other times on the earth. They're really worried about this and they feel a, a responsibility for, for addressing these things in the classroom. Best thing we can do is support them, equip them. It's amazing, people do do things of very high quality. It's, it's a heck of a challenge to get the word out. It, it's amazing, it's so different, for example, than an area of technology. So if somebody in a laboratory comes up with a faster or cheaper way to sequence DNA, it spreads around the world like that. You come up with a little better way to teach some aspect of biology or physics or mathematics or whatever, and maybe you know about it, <laughs> right? Um, so sharing good teaching practices is, is really an inefficient and um, um, slow process. Uh, again, my organization, we've tried to create various ways for institutions and large groups of educators to, to share sort of best practices and to come up with better practices. So we, we fund a whole lot of sort of pioneers who are doing original things that haven't been done before. Um, but when I arrived, one thing that was clear was, you know, to do something or to disseminate something on a national scale is really challenging. Fortunately, we're a philanthropy, so, you know, we have some resources and, um, and all the media that we make is distributed for free. So it's free on DVD, it's free for download, it's free streaming, et cetera. Um, and that's a really important thing to getting things out there, is, is making people aware that it, you know, making something of quality, making people aware that it exists, and eliminating the cost to the best, you know, the greatest degree possible. In some environments like Dow, Utah, um, you may not be able to even reach those people, the people that don't know and therefore aren't seeking. Yeah. Or afraid to seek. Well, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, if I just talk about biology teachers, I, I've heard all sorts of individual stories. Teachers who were pressured by their principals not mm -hmm. to teach evolution. Mm -hmm. Teachers who were threatened by, all it takes is one set of parents in the classroom can make well, and as, life Well, when they leave the school, um, in, in some of those southern communities, you're compelled to almost like join a church Mm -hmm. If you don't, then you're an outsider. Yeah. And you're shunned. Like obviously in Utah with the Mormon thing, yeah. it can be actually quite scary yeah. to be rejected by your family. So my I think the what I read from the New York Times was that uh, it's costly to review books. So they rely on the state of Texas, their school board to do that. And then it, that just gets adopted. One of the problems is that the uh, religious right has taken over the um, stewardship of that, and that they, uh, there's a rotation, a uh, seven year rotation, science has just come up, and they continue to peck away at the uh, uh, evolution in particular. Yeah, so it, the situation's a little better. Uh, so here's the deal much of what you say is true. Texas. Oh man, the school board down there, uh, you know, they're, they're appointed by the governor, then there's, there's also elections, and um, they've had lots of fights, not just in biology, but believe it or not, in American history. So what about the uh, red-blue thing, urban uh, country? So as the election uh, just displayed, that there's a dichotomy in the state, how does that play into the uh, dissemination? Well, school boards, are, school boards are different, but again, if there are state standards, I mean, I think this is, this, this, so this is the, the real different thing, and I don't know how, it, how it's run in Canada, but uh, I know how it's run in the UK. It's nice to have sort of one national standard. But in the US, it's 50 different states, and lots of different school districts can paddle in different directions. They've decided, I think wisely, that many states are gonna paddle in the same direction in terms of science standards. And so that is addressing this deal of essentially uh, divide and conquer, that there would be districts that are, um, you know, going their own way and not preparing their kids in, for example, STEM disciplines. And I think that even in the red states, uh, or even in very, in, in red districts, there's also the issue of some recognition that STEM jobs, uh, science and technology jobs matter. And, and there's been a fair amount of punishment of states that have earned a bad reputation for science education. Um, I mean, a, a, a bad reputation, I mean, you know, companies where they want to locate, um, 
you know, it, uh, the re one reason why you've all heard of Kansas is because actually there were brave people in Kansas who stood up and fought these forces in Kansas, whereas other states, not, this has not necessarily happened. So I think that um, the red-blue thing is true about U.S. demographics uh, in terms of urban versus rural, but even in rural districts, uh, they have to pay attention to whatever the state standards are. And this, is, this has been the movement now for a lot of years to get around the uh, dilution of standards or the, the divergence of, of standards in, depending upon where people live. Well, yeah. Back, back to what you said at the beginning and the title of your talk and the reference to school, storytelling. Uh, my, my only reaction is that the word storytelling has a bit of, it's a bit of an entertainment angle to it and I really wonder whether that is the kind of alternative to memorizing by text, uh, by just memorizing and so on. Uh, so, wouldn't you say that learning critical thinking and argumentation would be a better way of connecting all the facts rather than storytelling? Because story, everybody can say a storytelling. I don't think it's a matter of one or the other. I think it's that we've missed, I think, some opportunities of storytelling. And I would just put it this way. I don't, I'm not talking about this as a systematic way towards teaching science all the time. I don't know what the story is for photosynthesis. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to try to improvise that song. Um, I think, I, I would put it this way, if you think of some of the biggest ideas in science, um, wouldn't we like most of our citizenry to know some of the great ideas in science, right? And not worry about, you know, do I really care that they know the difference between a purine and a pyrimidine? I don't, okay? But do I care that people understand, you know, what was the mystery of heredity and how did DNA solve that and in what way is DNA an explanation for sort of the stability of life or the change of life over time? I really think that's an important thing to know and, or to under, at least to, to grasp. So how do you get that across in a way that might stick, might stick past that class, past that test, et cetera? And I think they're, you know, much like we want people to understand the story of the American Revolution or the story of the Civil War or, um, you know, the story of the Industrial Revolution, there's, this, there's stories within the scientific revolution and the really revolutionary ideas in science. I think people should know the stories behind those as, a, as an example. But to know the stories behind those, they have to be exposed to them. And the people who are in front of the classroom have to know what those stories are. I think there's, there's been science to show that if you want to get the common denominator to understand the topic, that you have to put it into a narrative that you, the, the process ends up with them. Yeah. So it's the, the journalistic approach. Right. There's, you know. To so this is, this is cognitive psychology, and sort of it's called narrative theory. And, I, and, I'm, and again, I'm not trying to come here and say, uh, I have the solution for you, and it's all about storytelling. I have, I have only, I think, a missing ingredient that's harmed us for a long time, which is not recognizing that people engage with a narrative, and they share a narrative as well. And so we know that narrative helps people connect events over time and cause an effect. And I think that's what we have to be cognizant of in, a, in an educational setting. Maybe the word negative is, uh, has less baggage than the word Yeah. I don't know. Um, to, 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 I tell you, to non-scientific audiences, storytelling is very friendly. And so it, it sort of, I mean, I, I think when I use the word storytelling, all my science peers are kind of stiffen a little bit. It's like, well, wait a second. What the hell are you talking about? And, uh, you know, um, other folks lean forward and feel that science is being made a little more accessible. Are you, are, do you mean that storytelling in the way that creationism can be taught as a story and it's engaging and it can, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because all of the magic and stuff, I mean, is it that way? You'd like to teach science the way that we can teach, or evolution the way that we can teach I think there's a, I think there's a narrative story. I mean, let me take that because I think that's a great point. And let me just kind of tease that apart a little bit. The problem that I see it, the, pro the problem that I, I was trying to kind of get at with the word storytelling, I think she's describing it. You can narrate like, I mean, creationism, kind of but not so much like science. Yeah. Well, no, I actually would say I, if, I, if I gave you the challenge yeah. of yeah. come up with a narrative that illustrates, for example, the natural origin of species as opposed to the divine origin of species, come up with a narrative that is just as engaging as Genesis. Yes. And I think it's doable. Yeah. And I think that if kids hear it, 
there's a fighting chance. <laughs> there's, there's a, that's, I, I, well, I'm getting better than those. Well done. Yeah. They're pretty good stories, yeah. Um, go ahead, go ahead. So but I don't would trust. You want to, okay, now you're getting now you're getting to you're getting to strategy. Good to yes. Yes. Engage people, or I like I think it would be here in Canada because we have you know the education system that might be able to have them access technology, but not so much in the states. That's all. <coughs> well, it's un, it's un, it's uneven in the states, but um, so so a couple things about that. Yes. Yeah. You know, the least effective way of teaching is talking to somebody. So when I say storytelling, I don't mean, uh, you know, yeah. a white bearded <laughs> academic at the front of the room stoning everybody to death with, with yarns, um, unless they're an incredibly great yarner. Uh, I think there's various media that really tell a story well. For example, short films, uh, animations, games. And when I say games, again, games have this negative connotation, but games are an interactive thing. Games are a way to actually engage with data. Um, virtual labs, things like this. And these are very cheap to distribute on a massive scale. Why aren't they doing that? Well, that's a, I'll, so I'll tell you, it's exactly what we've been doing for the last two years. Okay. And, and uh, so there are, there are stories that we've put on film uh, that, all right, now so you're just gonna have to uh, just grant me this is gonna sound unabashedly self-promotion, but I'll just tell you, you know, this is it. You got, you're gonna judge whether or not this is worth doing. So here you go. So there are stories, in fact, in books like that, um, that I felt really had, that were sticky. They really were memorable. They were easy to get if you could get the ingredients. And if you take kids out into a part of the world where they've never been before, using film, and they encounter scientists doing what they do, and they essentially get in the shoes of the scientists, and they follow his or her sort of detective work, um, you know, it's a story. And teachers tell us, and it's about right, that about a 10 or 12 minutes is about the right length for, us, for sort of a full story. And then if you give lots of inquiry-driven supplemental materials that allow the teachers to then use the rest of the hour or the next day to engage that material, small groups, interactively, looking, you know, working with data, counting M&Ms, whatever it might be, now you're in the ballgame. First trio of short films we released in, released in fall 2011, we know have been seen by over three million kids in the US. That's about six times the entire broadcast audience of a science film on cable. So the key is, and the reason why we did this for, we do this for the classrooms is, if you gave me the, it, it's the same thing, you asked me about scientists and science writers. If you said I have to do anything about the situation in the US by addressing adult audiences through television, I quit. Okay, I quit before I get started. It's just too hard. There's hundreds of channels to look at. I can't get to much of an audience. And there's no one stopping them from clicking. Kids are a captive audience. They have to be in that room, okay? And there's an educator at the front of the class guiding all these activities. Equip him or her with good stuff. You have a fighting chance to change the ball game. And so, give the kids a chance to choose. Like, you won't captivate every single kid in the classroom, but if you give them no. different avenues to learn sort of the same thing, then maybe. That's <laughs> right, and you give them different flavors. So whether you like the, you know, whether you like the pocket mice of the southwestern deserts or the ice fish of the Antarctic, or the lizards of the Caribbean, um, there are stories out there from the real world that help kids understand the, both the scientific process and the content, sort of scientific principles that you want them to, to get to. Film alone is not enough, so when I say storytelling is just an adjunct. Film alone is not enough, kids have to engage, they cannot just passively sit there and, and listen to a story or watch a story, they have to engage with this material and they best to do that in small groups and to explore what, what those ideas are. Well, no, no, you can evaluate whether or not you get learning gains by doing it that way. You can also just evaluate whether the teacher is a pretty good judge of whether or not those sort of lesson plans work better than what he or she had planned before, which was drier. But are, are, yeah. are, is there different systems in the education, especially in the states, where they only go by quantitative, like they have to have numbers in order to see 
Yeah, numbers, numbers are still a pretty big thing there. Um, but, you know, part of, part of the challenge is that the kids spend enough time with certain types of content and that they're engaged with it. So you're really, you're just looking, you know, your, 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 your first goal is get kids to engage with the material for a sufficient amount of time that you've got a chance that it's going to sink in. Um, so, so that's, uh, I'll just give you that as, as an example. So, for example, we're just finishing uh, our work, so we've released six films on evolution, um, three more coming this fall, that will kind of be our bit. And, you know, a lot of these are very contemporary stories, but we've gone out in the field with scientists, um, and uh, you can judge. So these are all freely downloadable, streamable, et cetera. If you go to hhmi.org, uh, biointeractive, and look under short films, they're all there. You can judge for yourself whether they're any good. Um, and all of them have all sorts of supplements that um, the, the teachers use. And we know, we know, we obviously track all this sort of data. The, uh, the uptake of those supplemental materials by teachers has been massive, really massive. So um, if we've shipped 40,000 DVDs of one film, we're, we're seeing 200,000 downloads of the supplemental materials. That's on the teacher side. So we know that this is, this is a large amount of stuff. I, and my team's on the ground at all major national teaching conventions, regional conventions, state conventions, et cetera, making teachers aware of this stuff. Now look, it's not the, you know, it's not gonna solve everything, but it's, it's just we're trying to make a dent, we're kind of change the model a little bit. Um, something else to look, like, look at in these things, uh, we've, we've got an iPad app called Earth Viewer, those of you who have an iPad, that allows kids to experience kind of the four and a half billion year history of the Earth and manipulate the globe through time and understand mass extinctions and climate data and plate tectonics, et cetera, all at once. Uh, that was the number two educational app for a while in the UK. That <laughs> 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 was about number 20 in the US, okay. <laughs> So that shows you something about the UK. Um, virtual labs, another way. So there's a lab, you, if you want to check it out, we're making more of them. Uh, we made a lab with the help of the community of people that work on a group of fish called stickleback fish, uh, which is a great model of, of evolution. And um, I would say that virtual lab is about as close as you can get to working with those fish without smelling them. Um, but again, using new media to allow kids to do inquiry-based uh, experiments and learn more about the scientific process. But this stuff is expensive to make, it takes time, it takes expertise, and somebody's gotta distribute it. You know, but again, I said we're a philanthropy, so that's where we're investing our dollars. So, um, and nicely, some of the major, uh, one of the major textbook publishers, a uh, huge textbook publisher, um, is distributing this material for free as well to all its instructors and incorporating it into its homework, its online homework systems, so. So for Evolution, we hope there'll be a nice portfolio of stuff that that people can sink their teeth into. And we're starting to make more stuff now in the area of genetics. My idea would be to kind of Bill Nye teach everything or something. <laughs> Someone exactly like him. I, I learned more from him than <laughs> any teacher kind of thing. Uh, Bill's, Bill Nye's coming back. I, oh, I'm seeing more and more of him. I think, I think he's. Like weird Al. He's just every generation he's going to get to the I think he's decided that the pendulum swung too far, and, yep. he's, and, and out he's out he's coming. Yeah. And he said he has said some really pointed things, and oh, uh, yes. and it's much appreciated. But yeah, yeah. I did just I, someone I, like him, a yeah. character. That I, I'll tell you something else. I, I should get into this because you, we talked about scientists and science writers, and now film and what can you do. I, I do look at certain demographics. I think this is important, especially for CFI to see that you know there's there's pretty there's a lot of surveying going on in the United States. But as a father of a 20 and a 23 year old, I'm really optimistic about the 18 to 30 generation. If you look at their attitudes about things, and if you plot this to the generation before them and the generation before, there are certain trend lines that are really clear. And I think you're looking at a generation that is certainly more globally aware, a generation that's, that on average is more, is better, uh, let's just say a little more uh, skeptical. Um, certainly more agnostic. Um, so that's, that was part of the, the data that I looked at and said, you know, I could spend my time you know, trying to debate 50-year-olds on CNN, but I think that's probably a waste of time. It might be entertaining, but I don't think it's effective. I think the best hope is to really focus on you know, ages four to 22. And see, and see, that's where that's where I think attitudes are still forming. But 
I mean, I, I think that the, the survey data looks at that. So if you look at America on a whole and you say, gee, how have attitudes not changed? They've changed demographically. There are, there are changes afoot. You look at all sorts of attitudes in the younger side of America. I, I think that's a, that's a really, I think that's evidence of, you know, a really different future than a past. And they're taking, I wouldn't say they take for granted because I think, in, in fact, I think this current generation um, had, had a pretty big, effect on, for example, the gay, the gay, gay rights discussion, which really changed dramatically just even since 2004 in the States. And it's a much more, um, it's, an, it's a, I think a generation that's much more insistent on tolerance. I think it's much more sort of ingrained in them. And I'm, you know, I'm positive about that. And, and, and as I said, I'm not trying to, def I, I think you can probably tell I'm not going to defend the United States, but I still wake up in the morning amazed at who's in the White House, because I think I think in 08, you, you just could have never persuaded me that would have happened. And the, the mountain that was built against him in the next four years, and he still won in 2012. And that's a big uh, reflection of, I think, of shifting demographics in the US. I say that with uh, some, some Camusian optimism. Do you want to get back to his education? Yeah, we did. There are different approaches, and I happen to uh, favor a different approach, and that's more along the lines of teach the controversy. I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that if people come into a classroom with misconceptions, <coughs> that just telling them good stories and teaching them all the right stuff has a very low chance of changing their misconceptions. Mm -hmm. The only way to change them is you actually have to confront them. Right. You actually have to say, look, I, I know you're thinking this way, but here's why that's not true. Mm -hmm. Here's why that's incorrect. And here's how you should be critically thinking your way out of this dilemma where you, you're perceiving something that's wrong. The difficulty with the creation evolution debate is that that's prevented in all American schools. And so you can't raise the question of their misconceptions. You simply can't directly say, <coughs> you know, intelligent design is, 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 is stupid and wrong. <coughs> you're not allowed to do that in American schools. But in general, there's a tendency to avoid conflict and avoid controversy. And that's actually detrimental. It, it actually doesn't work. If, if you know that most of your students will go home at night and drink some water, call it a homeopathic remedy, and not bother seeing the doctor, <coughs> then you should teach in class why that's wrong. Right. Why you shouldn't do that. Okay? And, and, right. and, 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 and there's a lot of data showing that that's the only way you well, have to yeah, if you're trying to change minds, the other thing is hopefully not have them form such thoughts in the first place. But, but let, me, let me address the thing about, oh, about creationism. I, I think there is a way to do it. And, and let's just stay in touch after this because I'll, I'll send you um, something we're, we're wrapping up right now, which is, I'll just throw this out to you and you can see what you decide. Uh, I think the way to understand, one way to very legitimately understand the difference between creationism and evolution is to experience it the way Darwin and Wallace did. It was the prevailing idea of the day, special creation. They went out on these voyages. They observed a certain pattern of distribution of animals. They tried to make sense out of that. And they couldn't reconcile it with special creation, the, the, prevailing, idea, the prevailing idea of the day. And it allows you to talk, talk about special creation and ideas about God and divinity. At the same time, you're talking about the birth of the, the theory of the origin of species. So I think there is a way to bring that in and realize that that was an idea that 150 years ago people confronted evidence that just wouldn't fit with that idea. Sure. The Does that sound? Get, get rockers to do it. <laughs> Film it. No, actually, no. That's, that's, that's trying to sneak it in by the back door. It's not really complicated. And what you have to do is, you know, if they've read a book by Jonathan Wells or, or Stephen Meyer or any of their intelligent design people and their parents know about these adopted all that way of thinking, if you don't specifically say why they're wrong, you, you don't have a whole No, I think probably by that point, um, you, yeah, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to uh, recall them. But I think that uh, as, a, as first exposures, I, I, don't, I think that's probably, yeah, what I just said is probably not sufficient if they've gone to, if they're at that level. I don't think there are a lot of kids that are that far gone at that level. I don't think they've had much exposure to anything, let alone to you know, good science or bad science. But I just say there are, I think, one way to, and, and you, because you, I just want to, you know, 
mildly object to the idea that storytelling is just telling them the, what we know. It's also following the it's following the, the paths of what the alternative ideas were, even the wrong ideas scientists might have had at first. Why did evidence change people's minds? Um, we're releasing a film which is the double helix, and people you know, might take for granted that I guess we know DNA, about DNA, but actually, you know, Watson and Crick were coming up with a, several wrong models before they came up with the right model, and the right model had to explain a lot more than what their wrong models were doing. And so I think it's to get students to understand science as a, as a pro process of just keep testing it against evidence and that, you know, wrong ideas get, um, you know, get corrected through that. So I think it's, it's valid for kids to understand that special creation was the prevailing idea and that it was replaced, essentially, by Darwin and Wallace with a natural explanation of the origin of species. I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to point that out. It might not be sufficient in all cases, but I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to do that. And I don't think they get exposed to that now. We're talking about methods of, of dealing with these sorts of ideas. And I think there's a, there's a large body of work on um, you know, the role of the messenger. And for example, if, if uh, I'm talking to a large body of people and there's a choice between, you know, bearded academic scientist, predictable scientist, and clergy person, and we say exactly the same things in certain audiences. This person is going to be very effective. Um, so, in, strategically, the messenger really matters. So, one one call it a strategy in the United States has been to engage the clergy and get their support for the teaching of evolution. So. Well, here's a big misconception. I, was, I went to Catholic high school. I was taught evolution, no fine print from, from the get-go. Catholic schools have been teaching evolution for more than 60 years. Um, so there's, a, I think, a misunderstanding that all Christian denominations somehow re resist the, the teaching of evolution. Not at all true. There are certain denominations that absolutely resist it. But when kids, and I've done this experiment a number of times, when kids um, see members of the clergy, say for example a, a, a Catholic priest, open the conversation by saying, well the evidence for evolution is overwhelming, now let's just talk about the theological implications. For kids who've never heard that, they're stunned. But they're seeing somebody who's obviously committed their life to faith say something about evolutionary science and they are curious, they are listening. You know, if they grew up in a household where they were never exposed to that. So there are other strategies to get kids, I think, to see that there is um, some gradation here. And uh, so um, there's a, if you have not been exposed to this, you may know about the clergy letter. This is a letter supporting the teaching of evolution signed by 12 or 13,000 <coughs> clergy in the United States, the, the clergy project. And uh, that, you know, I saw the look on your face. That was surprising, right? Okay. So there are different kinds of alliances. That's a tricky alliance because I think that if, you know, some of the people who are involved in, in you know, evolution education, a hardline anti public anti-religious stance um, absolutely forecloses any kind of alliance there. But if you decide that for the good of the kid that they should be taught, you know, real science. There are there are alliances, there are working relationships to be had there. I had this very discussion with Richard Dawkins. I said, you know, this is one way to approach things in the United States. And he, I thought, I thought he would be, you know, resolute against. He said, no, absolutely, it makes a lot of sense. You know, because the first the first ground to take is science. The first issue is is teaching good science. Some of these other issues that might be of you know strong personal interest to us. They're not necessarily even something that you should think you're going to make a lot of progress on in the, in the public schools. But teaching good science seems like a reasonable goal. So at school boards that are wavering on the teaching of evolution, and this was Jeannie Scott's, uh, I think she must have been one of the pioneers in this strategy, bring in the clergy to talk to the school board and say, no, evolution is, is good science. It's got to be taught. You know, religious doctrines taught on Saturdays and Sundays at, at, at church. And in our in our own schools, so you know it has no place in the public schools. So there's a really you know there's there's enlightened clergy to work with on this matter, 
And in a place as complex as the U.S., sort of region by region, district by district, um, if your goal is the teaching of better, you know, better teaching of science, these are some of the, um, these are the, some, some of the things that have materialized in the last 10 or 12 years. Well, we have to uh, wrap it up right now. Uh, Sean is a very busy person. <laughs> He's got lots of other issues to attend to. But would you please welcome me and giving Sean a hand for being with us? Thanks. Thank you. Center for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. This event was hosted by the Center for Inquiry Canada, an educational charity promoting science, reason, secularism, and free inquiry. CFI Canada coordinates branches and campus groups across the country, runs a public education series, provides secular community services, incorporates cutting-edge multimedia such as blogs, podcasts, and YouTube, and is a regular voice in the press presenting a secular humanist, atheist, and skeptical perspective. Visit us at www.cficanada.ca and contact us at info at cficanada.ca.